we actually had some great peer-to-peer -peer technologies pop up in web one, web two timeframe, and they just got shut down pretty quickly. Um, a lot of them because they, they took off in music and well, we know the power of the music uh, business uh, is, is intense. And, and they were really good at putting down Napster, which in a lot of ways dampened peer-to-peer -peer, um, progress, I would say even globally, which was a shame because those technologies that are underlying that are also underlying some of the great work that's happening today in Web3. Uh, there's just sort of been a resurgence because of an understanding of the, the issues that Web2 created, which is we no longer feel secure. We no longer feel like we have control of our data or our identities. We no longer feel like anybody can participate in the web. We feel like there are very, very, very large players who control it all. Web3, of course, came along in, in lots of ways, and I'd say it's super at its infancy right now, and we don't know what all it's going to be. Um, I, I think there's a lot of different ways people view it. Some view it in, in terms of blockchain. I don't see it that way. I see it much more broadly. Um, I think what blockchain did as part of this genesis in Web3 was bring in the distribution of new forms of money. And that is what makes it a little bit unstoppable, I think, right now, compared to the early peer-to-peer -peer work that, that evolved. So it's, it's exciting, um, but, but Web3 for me is really the opportunity for tech to go distributed. And it, it happens when our data is not stored in honeypots that large companies or governments or others have direct access to. I think where there's so much more to come is really in the use of of peer to peer technologies for identity, peer to peer technologies for um, how we coordinate and solve problems, uh, IoT. It, it, we just haven't really scratched the surface, and and now with the world moving into also technologies with AI and VR, I think it's critical that we have base level stacks of technologies that do make it peer to peer because I'm not interested in the metaverse unless it's peer to peer. I don't want even more of my data, personal data, my interaction data, my human bio data online in centralized areas that can be completely taken advantage of. And so I think it's critical that that this evolve now in tandem with some of the other tech evolutions that are happening. I can have a whole chain application that is completely peer to peer, where if you have the rules of the application and I have the rules of the application and we transact, interact, whether it's a chat, whether it's a um, video call, whether it's um, a coordination for where to meet, uh, a, 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 an Airbnb transaction type thing where I'm agreeing to, to do some service with you and receive some funds from you. Holochain allows that to happen between individuals. And then transactions on a Holochain um, DHT, which is the distributed hash table, they are validated by others who have the application, but they're not part of it and they don't have to do it in, in order for the application or the transaction to take place. This makes it incredibly more efficient than blockchain. It makes it able to be a peer-to-peer -peer application framework for any type, any type of application. It doesn't take as much time and it doesn't certainly take as much energy. And that's the way we get this sort of trust built into applications that matter that aren't just money, right? Because I want to be able to coordinate important aspects of my life, whether that's having somebody stay at my house to care for my dogs, I don't need a middleman holding all the data about me, holding all the data about those people. 
it's not necessary. We can actually be in an application where there's a certain amount of shared data and a certain amount of private data, but the transactions themselves are validated. And maybe we also use a different application for getting um, identity verification done that's also done in a distributed way that I don't have to go to a KYC provider that's doing it in a centralized way and holding all of my data. Those are vulnerabilities. Those sorts of things don't require other companies in the, in the middle. They don't require other governments in the middle. And that's what we really need. And Holochain makes that possible in ways that blockchain isn't quite there. And I'm not sure that um, they can get there in the, cert, in the current you know, structural designs. There's a few really exciting places. I, um, I think the music industry is one area where Web3 is so needed and so critical. The system of, um, the, the system of, music corporations, because I won't even call them record companies anymore, um, is broken. They're basically just profiteering. They don't add hardly any value anymore. And they own the legacy music of the world. And they, we can't really change that because of the way that the laws were written when they took control but they don't have to own the music of the future. And I think that there are a wide variety of projects that are sort of testing the waters right now in this area. And I don't know which ones are gonna be the best yet. I'm excited about a lot of them. I think that, they, that the idea that somebody can create, create music and share music with individuals, with large groups, publicly or even privately, and that it doesn't ever touch the, the current system of music uh, industry is fantastic. I think that people are seeing that there's value in performance, there's value in the actual music itself that can be shared, and then there's value in this whole world that, they've, that has taken off on social media that I think needs to come off platforms also related to music and artists and how individuals connect to and get access to the artists because that's just as important as the reception of the music itself. So I think that the mixture of social, uh, pl social media on Web3 plus individual musicians sharing their work in new ways and getting compensated in new ways uh, using Web3 platforms or Web3 technologies is just phenomenal. use them. I mean, honestly, if you're hearing about this, if you are a web user of applications and um, you're concerned about your data, you're concerned about your privacy, you're concerned about uh, transacting it, it, with systems or companies that uh, you don't trust, stop using those services. Look for peer-to-peer -peer versions of those services. And some of them may be very early stage, become an early adopter and a tester for them. There are so many, um, there are so many groups out there creating peer-to-peer -peer apps right now. And they're young, uh, they're, they're oftentimes not super well-funded yet, they will get there. Another way is if you're an investor, start looking at how you can invest in peer-to-peer -peer, uh, applications and technologies. Some of that investment is um, got very clear business models, but I want to remind everybody, Amazon didn't have a business model when they got started either. Um, these things will evolve, they will come. And I think the people who are getting involved right now are going to be in a great, great position, uh, both in a business way and in a personal way, uh, when this really kind of matures. I think adoption is the biggest challenge that Web3 has. Naysayers don't really mean much because plenty of people say something will never work and then it does. But 
if we look at technology that has really taken off, almost all of it has been because it got easier. It got easier and it got easier. And I think that for each different type of Web3 tech that's coming along, there is an opportunity for it to take off and an opportunity for it to die. And if you go back to a, an example with like uh, video, video, video tapes, you know, VHS and beta is a, you know, classic story where the tech was coming, the larger aspect of the tech made it, but some projects didn't, and even some of the better projects didn't. Um, and it was because they didn't quite hit the usability or the price point or the, you know, the sweet spot of something right away, or, you know, things can be done too soon. Uh, I think some of the crypto projects that we've seen have been a little too soon, or there hasn't been enough to follow on uh, on them that makes it really valuable for people. So it was a lot of work and then they didn't get all the value that they wanted out of it. Um, the, the thing is, is I think in most cases, we're gonna have that value evolving more and more over the next decade even. Um, and so there will be winners and losers to some degree in that, that evolution. But I'm not sure we're gonna stop all of distributed technology. And to me, that's really what Web3 is. So I think what we're seeing now and why it's so important that this evolve right now is because going out on the street and protesting and saying, we wanna see change, hasn't actually shown us the change that we wanna see as individuals and communities and societies. And so Web3 allows us to put a little bit more of that power in our own hands and say, well, if it's not gonna be managed at this governmental coordination level, then it can be managed at this individual communal application level. That's just critical right now. We are clearly, we, we clearly have many, many forms of governance that are too large and they're ineffective. And I'm not for creating massive revolutions in any way. I think I want a stable life. Um, I see when there are crises and chaos in the world, it causes more harm than good. But what I want to see is an evolution of governance that actually gives us a more equal say in how things work. And that's what Web3 is making possible. And that's why it's so important right now.